Okay, so good morning guys. My name's Stephen Hunter. Okay, as Johnny said, uh, I'm from Fab Lab Belfast. Okay, now what I'm going to do is, over the course of the presentation, is I'm going to introduce you to the world of Fab Lab. If you've never been to a Fab Lab before, come on down, come in, have a look around. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the software we would use and how we interact with the open source software on a daily basis and how we kind of go through open source software and open source hardware to make a tangible asset that will maybe change the world in real time. Okay. So what is a Fab Lab? Okay, so a Fab Lab is a fabrication laboratory where we have the ability to make almost anything. Okay, so the concept is, is that you can go in, anybody can go into a place and use machines, use computers, use software on a completely approachable level where we can build something or create something and then go away with it and uh, hopefully within a reasonable space of time, okay? Not just that, but skills and the expertise within the Fab Lab that make it, okay? So you'll have everyone from design technology teachers, hackers, coders, artists, psychologists, all in this one space that you can go to and you can ask any question at all and hopefully they'll be able to, to give you an answer, okay? So basically, the, uh, the Fab Lab started off in MIT, okay? It started 11 years ago by a professor uh, at MIT for the Center for Bits and Atoms called Neil Gershenfeld. He set up a lecture, much like this, uh, on how to build almost anything. From this, a book was developed on how to go from concept to fruition, okay? But there was important standpoints within this book. Uh, it included open source software, it included open source hardware, and it included things like keeping cost to an absolute minimum, sometimes even building machines to build the product you wanted. Okay, so it's this whole concept of being approachable, anyone can go in, anyone can get something out, okay? So within this, as I mentioned before, we've got things like Fab Gurus, that's what people consider me, okay? So people would come to me with an idea, that idea can be absolutely anything from um, a new piece of code to make a CubeSat to a bookshelf to um, a robot that stands eight foot tall made out of stainless steel and maybe stands in your house and saves you drinks. It's, the idea can be absolutely anything. It's my job to sit down and teach you how to bring that to fruition. Okay, so um, basically these are the Fab Lab you apply to MIT to set up, okay? Now, in essence, it's a makerspace, but it's a makerspace with a name, okay? So there's over 700 all around the world. They're growing at an exponential rate, and it's completely free to use, okay? So when you set up a Fab Lab, you have a series of machines that have been carefully selected in order to build and maximize your output. Okay, so we have things like laser cutters. Now, the difference between our laser cutters and a university or a college laser cutters is that we don't care what we put under them. Okay, so quite simply, you go to the laser cutter in Queens, they will state, right, you're allowed to use air apply, you're allowed to use acrylic, and you're allowed to use cat. Well, that's all well and good. But what if you want to cut some cutting edge technology that you have just had manufactured in China and now you're not allowed near the laser cutter to test it. Okay, so that's where we come in. People come in with technology and say, can I stick this under? Can I put a pumpkin under it? Can I put sausage? Can I put toast? <laughs> We've cut it before. Um, I had one person who found a bone on a beach and wanted to know if we could engrave a face on it. So we took that bone. It was, a light, it was like a femur of a cow or something. Stuck it in a laser cutter and engraved a face on it. Okay, so what we do is we will go out to schools and schools look at laser cutters and the teachers are amazed by them. But the students, not, not so much. You know, it's, it, essentially they're just watching something like, ah, oh, that's a picture. So we'll get something like sweets. Stick sweets in, take a picture of them, engrave their face on a sweet and they can eat it. It's bringing that kind of approachability to technology in new ways that people haven't seen before, okay? So... Things like laser cutters, we would interact with them, we'd take them apart, we would mess about with them, they, we would show them how they actually work, okay? Um, one of the wee projects you can see on here is actually a lamp, okay? That lamp, 
I promised my colleague I'd mention it. It took her four days to build, okay? And uh, essentially, it's cut out of a piece of MDF, and uh, we have a rule in the lab, no glue, no screws. If you've used glue, you have failed, okay? So we don't like glue. And essentially, she put all these press fit pieces of acrylic into the thing. And from that, we ran a lamp designing workshop, which people could sign up for, learn how to make that lamp. And it's kind of like the same principle, except it's done on a bigger scale and people can make that stuff, you know? So from laser cutters, which we have about four of now, we go to 3D printers, okay? So 3D printers are all the rage now. They've been around since like 1980, but only now are we actually seeing them in people's houses and on people's desks, okay? So we have FDM 3D printers. For those of you that aren't familiar, it means fused deposition model, okay? So we melt stuff to build stuff. We use a filament uh, that is melted at about between 230 and 300 degrees. It's squeezed out of a hot end and it is laid up in layers, okay? So you can build things like phone cases. I'm from Yorkshire, so I don't pay for anything. And I built my own phone case. So that took me about six hours to design and about six hours to print. But that one phone case cost me probably about 20p to make. Not including my time, which to be fair, I don't value that much anyway. So I'm gonna spend six hours on designing a phone case. So yeah, we have a lot of 3D printers. Now, these machines are absolutely decimating every market they touch upon, okay? So uh, right from the housing market in China, they are now 3D printing houses at a cost of 5,000 US dollars each. They are printing 10 a day straight onto a lorry. They are employing two guys per company. They are whisking them out on the lorry Brain, drop, done. Simple as that. They're in the medical industry as well. So they're doing everything from 3D printing new medical equipment right through to 3D printing body parts using stem cells and whatnot in America. They can 3D print using cells at a molecular level where they can then take this, they can add it, they can form it and change it. Now, we don't do that in the fab lab. That being said, I have 3D printed my fair amount of skulls and femurs and all that kind of stuff but what we can do is to someone that needs a tangible asset to show to prove as a proof of concept for invest in i or just to have something we can take them in and we can say right let's start designing and not only would they not need to know how to design they would not need to know anything about 3d printers we would help them design it take it through and 3d print it so just yesterday, I got an email from a certain company. I'm not going to mention the company. They asked us to scan a certain body part of a cow, actually. And they want a large representation of this cow body part. And they came to us because they know we can do it, in essence. And we are problem solvers. So we've had archaeological departments come to us, 3D printing skulls. So then their students can take them take them apart, look at them. Uh, we've also had things like uh, LiDAR imagery from geological surveys, from the satellites where people want to just look at the actual uh, causes of fracking, how it can impact the environment. People will give us the files, we we'll 3D print them, and then they can take apart the landscape and actually see the effect of this on a real level, on a, a tangible level, rather than looking at a computer screen. Okay. CNC mills, one of my favorites. Okay, so we have large scale CNC mills, okay. Um, we have eight foot by four foot mills, which we are capable of cutting up to four inches thick. Uh, any wood off the books, we're not really supposed to cut metal, but we don't care, we'll stick metal under it as long as it's non-ferrous. Uh, we're cutting brass the other day just for fun. We have micro milling for electronics as well and PCB uh, manufacturing. We do a lot of PCBs where we would uh, design our own circuit boards, mill them out, code them up, and test them essentially, okay? Um, this can also be used in conjunction with casting and molding. So you can see quickly over those last few machines, we can almost start to build anything. We've got electronics in there, we've got milling, we've got all that kind of stuff, okay? And the vinyl cutter, okay? I have to mention the vinyl cutter. The boss makes me. It's not my favorite machine. It's a cool machine, but it's there. It does exactly what it says on the tin, okay? We can make large-scale vinyls. 
Uh, we recently got a van and we're quoted a thousand pounds to cover the van uh, in vinyl with Fab Lab name, Fab Lab Dal, Fab, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And uh, we ended up covering it for about 60 quid. And that was thanks to the use of open source software and the machines that we would use. So we essentially cut it all out, stuck it on the machine and saved the boss 900 quid. He was happy, I didn't see a penny of it, but there you go. So, what do we have? Okay, so first of all, we have electronics. Now, uh, as I said before, we can mill electronics, but we're also able to use Arduino and Raspberry Pis. Those are open source hardware. Going along with the ethos of the Fab Lab, we can actually use this hardware to prototype before we go anywhere near PCB manufacturing. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with an Arduino, it's a prototyping platform that we can plug stuff into and we can make it work. Okay? These are brilliant for making anything that you need sensing and moving. So, for instance, uh, my daughter approached me the other day and said, Daddy, I want you to make a robot as tall as you that moves and can play rock, paper, scissors with me. And I said, okay, that's, that's quite a tall order. So I sat down and I started designing it and I thought instead of manufacturing my own PCB, I'm going to use an Arduino. You can see the, the CAD file down there. Essentially, we can plug in things like stepper motors and sensors and you can use servos, control them on an accurate level in a real-time level and test things. And then you can 3D print the parts for this file and put it together and hopefully you'll have something that works before you even go near a mill, okay? Um, Raspberry Pis, I'm sure you're all familiar with Raspberry Pis. We have made things like uh, Pi Kids, okay? So we'll take those to schools, uh, put an emulator in them, make a small scale Pi Kid. Kids love it. It's an applicable kind of, um, it's, it's a fun thing for people to play with and mess about with and it, it gets them into it, you know? It's a place where you can just mess about and play and learn. Okay, so one of the things we've made is the BBC House, one of my favorite projects. Okay, so um, I was approached by the BBC one day and they are running a Make It Digital event, which essentially is to convey to everyone that you can build almost anything for very little cost, okay? And they said to me, build something big, make it extravagant. I've always wanted to build a house. I think it'd be cool, okay? so. Um, I said, right, give us a space. They said four meters by four meters. And I eventually came up with this concept here, okay, which was open source housing, as usual, no glue, no screws, and it had to be modular, okay. And they gave us the budget of a thousand pounds. They gave us a time limit of four hours to build the thing, and they gave us a time limit to take it down of one hour. And they said there could be no more than four people. <laughs> so me and my team kind of sat down and planned everything out. And uh, once we built it, we were able to prototype it on a laser cutter at very low cost. And then we were able to kind of decide, let's think about joints, let's go through this. I was able to ring up the Fab Lab in Barcelona, who are actually architects. They're uh, connected to IAC. And they says, use this design, use these kind of materials, they're best. I rang up the Fab Lab in Brazil, who were materials experts, and then I rang up the Fab Lab in Manchester, who were really good at materials too. So we're able to kind of use this network to our advantage and ring up the guys. And eventually we got it. So it was a uh, February 2015, it got put up. It was put up inside of two and a half hours. It was taken down in 45 minutes and it cost 500 pounds, okay? So since that, we have had um, a lot of interest uh, from Iceland. I've been invited over to Iceland, France, and Saudi Arabia to spearhead a kind of open source housing movement. I'm not an architect. I actually went to university and studied psychology. So <laughs> it's completely different. I've been building since I was no age, but being in a fab lab environment allows you to kind of extend and prototype and show this kind of thing off, okay? So my colleague is a mechanical engineer, a biomedical engineer, my other colleague is an artist, and that's us. That's three people in the lab, and between us we make almost anything, okay? So we can make all kinds of other things too. 
So we've made bespoke 3D printers. We were approached by um, a university. They pretty much, the, the head of department dumped a load of motors on the table and says, make me a 3D printer. Okay, and we said, okay. And they said, but I want it to print in ceramic. Okay, so we had to sit aside and design a ceramic 3D printer. And we eventually did, and now apparently it's in a glass case, and the students aren't allowed to use it, which is always good. And it's there as a showpiece. So we've done things for uh, large wall murals, where we would take in, we actually got a group of uh, youths from East Belfast. I don't know if you've been down the Albert Bridge Road, uh, there's a large mural there with a diamond. Apparently it's the only backlit mural in Northern Ireland, we did it. So we took in use from East Belfast. We showed them how to use these machines, how to use the open source software, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute. And uh, eventually they designed and built a large mural. This thing was massive. It was, it was like 25 foot wide and it was like 18 foot tall. And it got put up and it's still there. Thank goodness, you know. So we do a lot of 3D printing concepts for business. We get a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, social enterprises coming in, wanting something to take to invest in I and say, look, this is what I want. And having that actual tangible asset for a potential investor to hold on to makes the difference between getting your money and not getting it. And that's where we come in. Okay. There we go. Okay. Go talk about the workshops. Okay. So we use uh, different ways to teach people this. People can literally just ring us and say, look, I'd like to come in, and we book them in, and then we say, right, let's build something. Or you can come along to one of our workshops. We do workshops in everything from open source design, we do open source coding, all that kind of stuff. We do fashion design, furniture making, we do uh, talks on just about everything if people listen to us, and we do crafts and whatnot. So. Open source software, the good stuff, while you're all here. Fab Labs are primarily built uh, using Ubuntu. Okay, so it was actually the first time I was introduced to Linux was through Fab Lab. Um, I'd never tried it before, now I love it. I'd stick with it, it's absolutely amazing. Um, the reason we use that is obviously because it's open source. It fits in with the whole Fab Lab ethos of being approachable. And we know that if you can find software for Ubuntu, It'll run on pretty much anything else. Someone's probably built a Windows version of it or a Mac version, okay? So um, basically, we would use a very carefully select few uh, software in order to interact with all our machines, okay? Now, we have since had to dual boot our Ubuntu machines with Windows. It, it destroyed a little bit of my soul when we had to do it because then they all auto-updated to Windows 8 and thus to Windows 10 and it feels like we've gone back about five years, it's, it's no good. So, our first piece of software is Inkscape, okay? Inkscape, for those of you who don't know, is kind of like Illustrator, except it's completely free, okay? Um, and we can use it to interact with almost any machine within the lab, apart from the 3D printers. We can accurately draw vectors, we can import, we can trace images, we can, carve things, we can technically do 3D imagery on this, okay? We recommend it rather than using things like Illustrator or Photoshop and whatnot, okay? This actually comes uh, as part of the Fab Lab suite, which we can like give people essentially and tell them to mess about. This is one of the first pieces of software that people would interact with in Fab Lab, okay? It um, has its drawbacks. Obviously, okay, someone's clearly gone into the code and changed the measurements, okay? So when you type in you want something 10 mil, it'll change it to 10.0011111 or whatever. But the thickness of a human hair, we don't really worry about too much. Okay, <coughs> Blender, one of my all-time favorites. Um, I have been using Blender 3D for about 12 years now, 13 years, okay? I downloaded it when I was a teenager Essentially, it's a 3D design software package that is capable of almost anything. Okay, so we can do things like design very simple mesh models. Once you have designed those mesh models, you can export that and you can 3D print from it. So 
for someone who is not used to designing or not ready for you know investing four thousand pounds in a CAD package or Cinema 4D or Maya you can download Blender and you can play it and you can have a go at it once you've had a go at it you can literally just give us a file we can 3D print it and you can see what it looks like okay better than that you can actually import a lot of files so um, a lot of licensed softwares is not cross compatible okay this software pretty much sets any file type you can throw at it if you can find a file whether it be a step stl it be g or whatever you can import it you can have a look you can tweak it you can mess about with it and you can see what you can do you can also do animations in blender you can do high scale full renders and you can also um it'll work in conjunction with other rendering packages so I know Disney released their rendering engine, uh, Renderman, and they actually said you can use it in conjunction with Blender if you wish, and they released that open source, which is really good to see. Uh, it's got an inbuilt gaming engine with Python as well, Python scripting capability, and camera tracking. It's, they keep adding stuff on. Like the, the community of developers behind Blender is second to none. It's absolutely amazing. If you can't do it in Blender, you, you don't want to be doing it. It's as simple as that. So, plus well, okay, so this is kind of like the open source version of Photoshop. Okay, we would use this for image manipulation. I would use it quite simply to turn a JPEG into a PNG and add an alpha layer. It's very, very straightforward, very easy. Um, I love the user display on this thing. It's so much more simpler, okay. And for someone that's coming in and just wanting to do some simple graphics, rather than buying the Adobe Suite, download GIMP. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, so open source hardware, Arduino, our prototyping platform, okay, which I mentioned earlier, which we can use to prototype just about anything. We have made uh, the robotic arm, as I said before, right through to uh, prototyping. It was a uh, concept for a business where we had a fishing low and a guy came in and he loves to fish and he said I think the fish will love it more if the low was warm and if it vibrated so we essentially sat him down and goes right do you know anything about manufacturing he said no we said great and we had to help him design and build this thing and we put an Arduino into a fishing low and warmed it up and made it vibrate and then he was able to cast and mold this we took it out and he tested it and he actually got an investment for it to take it further and then to make the thing in China and see how it goes, you know? So, open source software. Um, the reason we're all here is open source, okay? We, we're here to try and promote the whole ethos of open source. And as a fab lab, we, we thrive on it. There's no point in telling people you can come in here and use our software and then when you go home you can't use it because it's going to cost you four grand for a license okay the reason we are so good at what we do and we kind of innovate and show people is that they're able to play they're able to make mistakes and you can do that because it's at no cost or low cost and that's what it's about it's about playing it's about learning it's about having fun it's about pushing the limits okay so I'll tell you a little bit about how we're member based. So if anyone wants to become a member, you can go onto our website, uh, fablabni.com. <laughs> Once you're a member, you can literally just ring us up, book an appointment. You can even come in for a chat or a tour with myself, uh, just to have a look around, see what we can do, and uh, just kind of learn something and interact. So we interact with everyone from universities to colleges to 10 year olds to housewives the other day. I had a granny in who wanted to decorate a, her old bedroom and she wanted cherry blossom trees, vinyl cut right across the top and then she went to redo her kitchen. And she was retired and she came in and we told her what to buy. She bought a lovely bit of bamboo plywood. We cut it out, she put it in the kitchen and now her kitchen is worth a whole lot more than she actually spent on it. And she's got lovely bamboo plywood, uh, door cupboards and everything like that. And that's us. Hopefully that helps. <laughs>